I just wanted to briefly thank the Asia Art Archive and University of Hong Kong for inviting me to speak today. Um, I'm very honored to be able to present the Japanese calligraphy periodical Bokubi. Histories of artistic exchange between Japan and the West after World War II rarely identify early connections established through the material circulation of art periodicals. Many tend to focus on the global activities of the Gutai group beginning in 1957. In 1951, however, the avant-garde Japanese calligraphy collective, Bokujinkai, began forging significant global connections almost entirely via their monthly journal, Bokubi, which I show here. Recent exhibitions featuring Bokujinkai, such as Black and White, Japanese Modern Art at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, and the show currently on view at M Plus here in Hong Kong, situate the group within a global post-war monochrome painting aesthetic, but there has been considerably less attention paid to the group's printed publications and how they functioned as artistic catalysts. The focus of this presentation will be the material significance of the group's periodical Bokubi, which through the 1950s consciously positioned itself as a transmitter of new images and texts related to calligraphy, inspiring artists in the US, France, and at home in Japan. Bokubi presented calligraphy as a common visual denominator, one that was arguably necessary to facilitate the earliest international conversations about art after World War II. By the 1960s, however, the journal had largely disappeared from international art conversations. And I should note that the journal continued to be printed until 1981, but in the 60s shifted into a much less international role. And like many of the periodicals discussed in this conference, its earliest years were in fact the most culturally significant. Boku Jinkai, which translates as People of Ink Association, was founded by Morita Shiryu, who I show here, and several other experimental calligraphers in Kyoto in 1952. After the war, many of these calligraphers explored using non-traditional tools and media, and all emphasized dramatic line and gesture as a means of personal expression. Many works were large sheets with a single monumental character, and here's one example. The artist Inoue Yuichi fashioned oversized brushes out of palm fronds and completed a series of works in enamel rather than in the traditional ink on paper, and here's one example. Works like this were different from traditional calligraphy in that the written characters were obscured, illegible, or even non-existent. This ambiguity allowed for various interpretations by the viewer. Bokujinkai artists united under this very conviction that regardless of nationality, Japanese speakers and non-Japanese speakers alike would identify with and be inspired by the form and the spirit of this expressive, modernized style of calligraphy. And this notion is what they termed sekaise, or world relevance. The group published several journals that served as a main platform for spreading their international ideals. Bokubi, or the beauty of ink, seems to have achieved the widest circulation. Edited by Morita, its inaugural issue was published in 1951 by Shodo Shupansha, and that's the cover. This was notably actually one year before the official founding of the group, suggesting that the magazine itself may have been some sort of impetus. The cover of the issue featured a work by the American painter Franz Klein and contained an essay on the state of modern art in post-war Japan vis-a-vis -vis the West, written by the Japanese painter and critic Hasegawa Saburo. And this is the first page of that article. This issue underscored the mission for Bokubi to reach an international audience that would study the world relevance of calligraphy. The early issues I focused on were roughly 40 pages and were about 50-50 evenly split between images and text. 
In addition to reproducing works by Boku Jinkai members, the group's, the journal's content rather, ranged from reproductions of traditional Zen calligraphy to feature length articles devoted to Western artists. And here I show you an example of each. The texts were written in Japanese, although titles and captions were translated into English or French. This diverse content presented through the lens of calligraphy revealed the publication's aim to reach both Japanese and international audiences. Painters like Klein, whose black forms on white grounds fuse the aesthetic of Japanese calligraphy with Western art practices, affirmed the belief among Boku Jinkai members that calligraphy could inspire artists worldwide. This belief was exemplified in a monthly feature that ran in Bokubi from 1951 to 1953. Dubbed the Arufabu, or Alpha Section, it reproduced calligraphic works with no lexical referent. And these can ultimately be seen as some of Boku Jinkai's most radical pieces. Notably, Western artworks that resembled calligraphy, such as Klein's paintings, were not included in this section. The separation points to the group's own delineation between calligraphy and abstract painting, an issue that would return to haunt them later. Klein's debut in Bokubi in 1951 was significant in that he became one of the first Western artists to be introduced to Japan after the war. In the opposite direction, Bokubi's arrival in 1950s America coincided with a voracious appetite for Japanese culture. Klein's own enthusiasm for the publication was clear. Following his debut in Bokubi No. 1, Klein wrote to Morita saying that he had distributed copies of the magazine to various galleries around New York. Morita then translated this letter into Japanese, which I show here at the top right, and he reprinted it in the magazine along with more reproductions of Klein's works in Bokubi No. 12. Beyond simply exp importing and exporting new artwork, Bokubi in its first years established rich connections by grounding communication in the accessible and reproducible motif of calligraphy. In Japan, calligraphy provided a familiar entry point to discuss post-war Western abstract paintings. In the West, the gestural brushwork of calligraphy seemed close enough to oil painting to begin artistically grounded conversations with Japan. Furthermore, because these calligraphic works were created in black and white, unlike most artworks, their impact was not completely lost in the periodical's black and white reproductions. Bokubi thus stimulated some of the first solidly artistic exchanges between post-war Japan and the West, catalyzing larger projects via its circulation. At some point after issue number 12, in its second year of publication, the size of the periodical shrank from being printed on size B5 to size A4 paper. The smaller size was likely more convenient to mail and suggests an expanded circulation after 1952. One of Bokubi's most fruitful connections in the US began the following year in 1953 when Morita circulated copies of the periodical to Arthur Drexler, a curator at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. In 1954, the museum opened an exhibition of Boku Jinkai's work entitled Abstract Japanese Calligraphy. Drexler selected works for the show via black and white photographs supplied by Morita. Morita clearly saw this as evidence of calligraphy's global appeal, writing, your own selecting of the works without any Japanese advice provided us with the greatest opportunity to realize what kind of calligraphic pieces could be interesting as art to be seen rather than to be read. Drexler similar, similarly presented the formal commonalities between calligraphy and abstract painting. And he wrote in the wall text for the exhibition, 
According to his personal inspiration, the calligrapher alters the ancient forms, somewhat like a Western painter who, in abstracting a figure or a still life, preserves only fragmentary visual clues as to the actual appearance of his subject. Drexler thus linked Japanese calligraphy with American abstraction, just as Morita published Klein's work to prove its affinities with calligraphy in Bokubi. Following the initial connection made by Bokubi, the MoMA show traveled to various US venues, and Bokuji and Kai members were also included in the Carnegie International in the late 1950s. Meanwhile, uh, Bokubi began circulating in France as early as 1952, when the Cobra artist Pierre Alishinsky started corresponding with Morita. In an essay published in Bokubi titled Beyond Writing, Alishinsky wrote that the spontaneous improvisational qualities of calligraphy were similar to jazz music. The similarities he found again show how calligraphy, as it was presented by Bokubi, functioned as a common denominator for discussing art in the East and the West. In 1955, Morita and Alishinsky collaborated on the circulating exhibition entitled China Inc. in Contemporary Japanese Art and Calligraphy. The show, using calligraphy as an impetus, posed broad artistic questions on abstract art versus writing. Bokubi again was the vehicle that instigated these post-war art discussions by forming key international connections. Thanks to these new European ties, in 1955, Bokujin Kai also had shows at the Colette Allondy Gallery in Paris and at the Apollo Gallery in Brussels. Following these early successes, Alishinsky introduced the magazine to the French art critic Michel Tapier, who then traveled to Japan in 1957. Morita printed translations of Tapie's articles in Bokubi around the same time. Unlike Alishinsky's interest in the visual subtleties of calligraphy, however, Tapie ultimately sought to discover original Japanese artists to add to his roster of so-called informel painters. Tapie dismissed calligraphy as already assimilated into an international style and instead embraced the Gutai group. And here I show him uh, shaking hands with the founder of Gutai, Yoshihara Jiro. Tapi's advocacy for Gutai may have elevated its global presence, but the circulation of Bokubi in France nonetheless sparked Tapi's initial interest in Japanese modern art. So from this perspective, the magazine's catalytic circulation sadly outgrew Bokujin Kai's own specific mission. The conversations generated by Bokubi in the US also faded over the course of the 1950s. Initial enthusiasm for calligraphy was stifled as American abstract expressionism gained international acclaim. Rather than discuss possible Japanese artistic influences on those artists, Critics like Clement Greenberg insisted on the total originality of American painters. Perhaps because of that assertion, Klein began distancing himself from Boku Jinkai, later dismissing any connection whatsoever. Still, the early communication channels opened by Bokubi paved the way for future international exhibitions and collaborations in the 1960s. In Japan, Bokubi generated a positive reception for experimental calligraphy abroad, which initially enhanced Bokujinkai's reputation and mission at home. For instance, Morita and his colleagues were selected by Japanese committees to represent the country at both the 1957 and the 1959 Sao Paulo Biennials. Bokubi number 87, which I show here, was devoted exclusively to Morita and Hidai Nankoku, the two calligraphers who were selected for the 1959 biennial. This periodical feature remains, even today, one of the most complete published sets of images by the two artists. 
an accompanying text, which I show here, um, where Morita and Hidai discuss their visions for calligraphy, suggests the Japanese art world's fascination with questions provoked by the art form. Similar to the West, however, we can witness a gradual move beyond those questions over the course of the 1960s, sorry, 1950s and 1960s. From the beginning, Bogujin Kai hosted panels discussing the parallels between calligraphy and abstract painting and published those transcripts in Bokubi, such as the round table from 1953, calligraphy and abstract art. And that's the first page of the published transcript. I draw attention to this panel specifically because of an, op of an opinion voiced by the founder of Gutai Yoshihara Jiro. He said, when it comes to the syllable ga, there must be three dots and there are many prerequisites like this in calligraphy. Shouldn't one transcend this limitation and devote oneself instead to form? If the calligrapher finds that his calligraphy has become painting, what is wrong with that? Yoshihara's words underscored that calligraphy as an idea spawned larger theoretical questions for Japanese artists seeking to create original works. These groundbreaking discussions circulated via Bokubi and may have pushed Yoshihara to launch Gutai, a group that famously privileged originality over tradition. Still, Bokubi's relevance in Japan nonetheless somewhat mirrored its relevance abroad. The familiar medium of calligraphy provided the foundation from which to import new Western artworks and from which to also question Japanese artistic practices. By making these new images and provocative texts accessible, Bokubi's circulation transmitted key ideas of the post-war Japanese art world, both locally and globally. Ultimately, however, the perceived limitations of calligraphy itself excluded Bokujin Kai from avant-garde artistic conversations. So from around 19, 1951 to 1960, Bokubi's advocacy for expressive calligraphy blossomed and then somewhat wilted in relation to the different national artistic contexts it encountered. In each country, the periodical itself nonetheless provoked early post-war communications based on the concrete visual motif of Bokujin Kai's calligraphy. By providing that foundation for discussion, the publication facilitated early idea-based artistic dialogues between Japan and the West. In a somewhat tragic turn, despite Bokubi's international circulation, this visual motif of calligraphy was ultimately perhaps too traditionally Japanese to remain part of the international avant-garde. So to conclude, if we consider Bokubi beyond its own stated goals to make avant-garde calligraphy a globally relevant movement, we understand that the exchanges it fostered through its international circulation endow the periodical rather than modern calligraphy itself with a successful and lasting form of Bokujin Kai's desired world relevance. This was unfortunately not the Sekaise envisioned by Bokujin Kai, but it remains the conflicted and complex global legacy of its efforts. It establishes the circulation of Bokubi as a major material catalyst for post-war artistic interchange. So by recognizing this period periodical's pivotal role, perhaps we can study modern artistic exchanges with more emphasis on the groundbreaking publications that circulated new images and texts around the world. Thank you. <laughs>